All right, everybody. Thank you for joining today to PowerShell module mass production, templating in the field. We will be looking now at, well, templating in general. What do we want to consider? When do we go our own way? When do we use other solutions? And what do we want to look for in our modules to mass produce them? What about me? I'm Fred, cloud solution architect working at Microsoft. I'm, well, working since five and a half years there now and doing lots of PowerShell through all of the time. You can find me usually in the Discord under Fred. I'm a passive contributor. If you want to reach out to me, ping me somewhere. I will react, but I don't actively otherwise jump in. Well, usual habits of mine are, among other things, gaming, reading, bartending, and bragging about my toys. And there's a bit of that going to happen today as well. Not too much. But if you want to follow up on the talk, look up some resources, these are the links you probably want to do the photograph of. We are going to see but sample code, lots of PowerPoint, lots of considerations here. Everything will be found on my GitHub afterwards. And one of the solutions that we're talking about is part of the Peace Framework project, so the first link is kind of going to become relevant for that. Well, what's the plan? First, I'm going to introduce a little bit to my module solution reference architecture. How do I design solutions in PowerShell? How does that map to modules? We are going to look at the difference between a templating engine and a module solution, and the different considerations for each, including which is the right solution for me, or, well, do I write my own because none of the existing one does the job. Yeah, module solution reference architecture. I'm building lots and lots of modules. Large solutions for customers, some of which I can share with the community, some of which I can't. So I kind of developed a model, how the hell should a solution look like? Where do I place what command? How do I not lose sight of a PowerShell project that reaches tens of thousands of lines of code? Not necessarily all of them PowerShell. One of the problems that I frequently see with organizations as they scale up and lose sight of it is that there's like this one huge Contoso tools module that a few generations of admin have added content, content to, and nobody really is quite sure whether changing anything is going to bring the entire house of cards down. So this approach is designed to help you avoid that fate. The first layer, in my opinion, is the API layer. A mod API layer module deals not with any business processes. It doesn't care about what our admin problems are. It only cares about mapping like this technical solution, whether it's the Active Directory module, which maps the Active Directory service. Hyper-V is another example for Hyper-V services, Graph API, AZ modules. They basically don't really care about our business processes. They only care about well, giving us access to that service, to that product. On top of that, we have the process layer. Process layer modules, are only going to care about like the technical process, like it's solving a technical problem, irrespective of additional considerations we have from an organizational perspective. An example, an Active Directory, on-prem Active Directory, does the Kerberos account, KerbTGT, which all the main controllers use to encrypt the tickets that we get. And we should frequently rotate that password. So I've got a module for that called KRBTGT, which uses the API mod modules, Active Directory, and Group Policy to implement that technical workflow. On top of that lives the solution layer. This is where we are building our business workflows in. I've got um, well, a business requirement that I now need to translate into technical solution, and that's basically the controller unit that uses everything beneath that layer to actually implement the whole thing together. At this point, none of our projects have a single line of company-specific data in there. There's not an IP address, there's not a company name, no tenant IDs, there's nothing exposable in there because that lives in a data layer. The data layer could be a module, it could be just a config file that we set, it could be parameters on our commands, but it, uh, that is where actually our organization-specific content lives. Because that way, any module beneath that, I don't have to worry about any kind of exposure. 
I can share any of that as an open source project without endangering my organization, at least, at least process layer and API layer. This also makes it a lot easier to get well input from the community and share a solution with others and save on time. It also makes it easier to reuse a particular project in another, a particular module in another project. Well, you might have noticed there's on the left side a bit of a blank space here. This is where the framework layer lives. The framework layer doesn't care about a project. This is a general PowerShell tooling, not necessarily a module we depend, depend on. It is our toolkit that we share across all of our projects. Templating lives in the framework layer. But however we go about templating, we will be discussing this in a bit more, but that's what we put in the framework layer. PowerShell specific tools that um, it don't have any, any product relationship can live there. For example, logging. Every reasonable project that we're going to be do will need logging. But the logging itself is never specific to that particular solution that we're building. Configuration handling. Maybe other accelerators that simplify our coding. Now, some of you might be thinking, Fred, are you trying to sell us on PS Framework? The answer is yes, <laughs> but that's not the point. Basically, uh, I did not kind of, you know, always knew this in my heart that this is the way a project is supposed to be going. Rather, it's, it has evolved over time, and PS Framework has evolved over time to be my P framework component. It doesn't have to be one component. It can be individual parts for your, that you build on your own that work for you. But many people have asked me, Fred, why can't you just split PS Framework into multiple components? Well, in my opinion, it always was like, part like this common toolkit that's always available, so splitting it up would have added a lot of labor, but not provided any value to me the way I'm using it, because it's my framework layer. It's the same everywhere. I might not use every feature every single time. Actually, I never use every single feature. I forgot some of them by now, actually. But, well. So, no matter what particular project we're currently doing, the framework layer remains completely undeterred. No matter if it's a, if it's a highly complicated, so, solutions spreading across our entire environment, but it's actually a simple script using a few utility modules. If it's the building framework that we're setting up, well, it's always the same toolkit, we can rely on that. And since we now have quite a few different modules that potentially exist, we of course want all of them to look exactly the same or as close as we can handle that from a structure. So if we now need to debug something, look into something, code happened half a year ago, I don't remember what crimes against, code it, against the code I committed half a year ago. At least I don't have to refigure out how the hell this project is, looked out, uh, is looking. So we want this to be always as uniform as we can from how a module is at least laid out. And that's where we are now going to look into the different templating aspects. The first disambiguation I want to deal with is we have two separate aspects. We have the templating engine and a module solution. A templating engine, from my perspective, is a code tool that is generating projects and that I can provide some different separate templates to that will then generate different uh, kinds of projects. While a module solution, well, that's the finish. This is going to give me a PowerShell module. The difference is I can use a templating engine for a lot more than just PowerShell modules. So either we have several project types or a templating engine, whatever the templating engine turns out to be, or we don't even have a templating engine and only have a standalone like kind of module generator that gives us, well, the solution there. For example, from an engine perspective, we have basically the first of them all that I know of in the PowerShell world, Plaster. We also have uh, PS module development, which is, well, yours truly here. Plaster by itself doesn't really provide much of a module solution here. But there's, for example, Stucco that will, or we build our own. PS module development, well, it brings its own templates along, but you're not stuck with them. It's only just I'm kind of strongly pushing my solutions as the way to go. More on that particular point later on. But uh, yeah, it can do a lot more. One of the difference here 
Plaster kind of assumes you're building a PowerShell module. Piece module development is just as happy generating a Python project or C Sharp project or my firewall config file. That's actually what one of my own tra old trainees is using it for by now. On the other hand, standalone project generators, we have one that's been rising a lot more uh, recently, Sampler, which does not actually provide for us a mechanism to write our own, provide our own templates, but it has a finished module solution that can generate for us and, well, DSC project solution, which is quite useful actually. So, yeah, templating engines. There's one more I really want to mention here, one that we keep forgetting about, or at least that we tend to limit our own thinking here. Another popular templating engine would be .NET. Just because we're generating PowerShell code doesn't mean that our templating engine has to be PowerShell. It can be in any language, any that worked for us, especially when we now need a cross-team uh, templating solution with different developer teams that have their own preferences. Do we need to have our templating engine be in PowerShell? Not necessarily. So the, your mileage might vary depending on whether you want some tool for yourself, for your entire team, for your entire organization. Yeah. So what would I look for in a templating engine? The first thing is who the hell is supposed to use it? Is it one person, is it me? Is it a group or is it an organization? The key differentiator here for me, single person, single project, fine, that's very simple. If you have a group, it's a people that belong organizationally together and where there's somewhere where we can get a, have a reasonable chance to get a management decision and push from above support for a particular part. Which means we have some control about some kind of enforcement controls here so that not everybody just ignores it and goes their own way. While organizations, when you're like, I want something for my entire company, I need to get buy-in, I need to give some pull factor why somebody should be using my solution. The same for open source projects in the wide internet. I kind of need to bribe you with some reasons to go for PS module development. You just don't do it because I have Fred says you must do that. The next aspect that we need to consider is what level of complexity, what kind of users have we, what kind of, what, how confident are they in using that, using that? Do we have some beginner admins that still need to write their own templates? Remember, we are the templating engine. It doesn't mean about people who then need to generate something, but who is supposed to write templates. In many cases, actually, we can rely on experts because only a few people are going to be providing the templates. But that might not always be true and is something to consider for our, well, template, template engine selection process. And the last one, and this is the one that I frequently see people ignore. Are the people that are going to be using this full-time developer, or are they actually busy with a job and have like one hour of PowerShell per day that they can invest on something? Whether they're good at PowerShell or not, whether they're, good, whether they're experienced developers in general, irrespective of the language or not, if they only do it occasionally and already are pretty busy, their ability to actually invest a lot of time in getting started on a new tool, on yet one more tool, besides the 50 or 100 other tools that they're already busy with, are pretty low. So again, we, in that case, we need to lower the barrier, which leads me to one of my well, favorite factors about the whole thing, and that is, um, we need to kind of reduce, look to reduce the time to carrot. There's so many great tools out there from Microsoft that I really love that first have to deal me with hours and days of stick until I finally get to the carrot. I mean, show of hands, who has ever looked into a trust enough administration? And who has persisted until deployment? About what I expected. Now, if for just enough administration, we have lots of good documentation on how to technically do it, but the time to carrot rate is horrible. It's atrocious because we need to deploy the full solution around that. Desired state configuration is a similar problem. We have a huge stick rate until we finally get to the carrot. So having a templating engine that allows us to get going in the first five minutes is kind of handy. On the other hand, usually the easier it is to get started, the lesser the complexity, the, well, the 
less we can actually do at the end of it, the less powerful it tends to be. That's not necessarily true, but it is some problem we have to consider in this regard. How many features do we need to support at the end of the day? Yeah, the size of the stick is the other problem. Um, how much pain do I actually have to go through to finally be able to do something? Even if it's fast, if it's, uh, if it's forcing me to use dynamic parameters, odds are I'm not going to be using it. That would be a large stick size for me. And finally, the last part that I want to look into is, um, well, the depth behind the solution. How extensible is, how flexible is it? What, what is my potential after uh, to do something with after I got started? Like, am I basically learning it in one hour and I'm done? Which is probably gonna be a very low complexity solution. Or am I going to get a lot more mileage out of it along the road? Which would be a very healthy long time investment. So, okay, what capabilities do I want in a module? After you know, I've clarified the skill level and the complexity that I'm willing to do with, we have the hard capabilities required. What do I need to have here? And the first one is, do I want to have PowerShell modules? If I can't do that, odds are I'm not going to be too interested. But can it also do other PowerShell projects? Can it do individual PowerShell files? Can it do a DSC solution? Can it do, well, anything? Can I insert dynamic content? Automatically generated date timestamps, yes, but can I, for example, also dynamically decide what file do I want in there? Typical example, multiple choice, what license is supposed to go with the project? I don't want to have five different license files here. Do I need to be able to insert values into Excel files or a pre-configured -con pre management PowerPoint presentation? depending on what our engine is supposed to be doing, having some, ext some extensibility here but could be great, but it might be a high-hanging fruit, speaking from somewhat of personal experience here. Um, do I need a human being answering things, or can it run unattended? When you have a template, you often need to like insert some values, like what is the module name going to be, and again, what license do I want it to be? Do I want this for GitHub, or do I want this for Azure DevOps? And if decisions need to be made, sometimes can it be done without? And can it do nested templating? Can it also do whatever else? What's our requirement? Can I do a C-sharp solution along with my PowerShell module? Do I want to be able to do a hybrid module? There's lots of requirements we could be addressing to it, and well, clarifying that ahead of time is a lot easier than later figuring out, all right, there was this other thing. Another fun one that we often don't consider is like, how the hell do I get the template to where they need to be? For example, can I deploy my templates through the PowerShell gallery or internal repository? Um, can I, do I have to explicitly import it? Do I need a, bootstra a bootstra uh, bootstrap file to get a coworker working on this? Or is this something I can simply depo deploy by policy that a new worker is onboarded and has immediately access to everything? Do I place that in Git? Or do I forcibly place it in the engine itself only? This could be a useful feature, actually. Specifically, when we only want people writing templates that actually control the template, if I don't want everybody to, well, brew their own module recipe, but I want to enforce people to use my module recipe, I might want to have a lock on who actually can generate and share templates with others. Well, on the other side, module solutions. What do we actually look into when we want to actually have this thing going? Now, this is where we really get started on the mass production of module sites after we not finally the engine running. And there's one first decision where people kind of give me the occasional bit of fire and burn. Well, dependencies. What dependencies do we accept in what aspect? What do we need when we generate a project? This is usually actually the easy deal. This is something we can do outside of any security context. The main problem that we have of dependencies really is if I'm asking people to deploy dependencies to hundreds of thousands of servers, 
Or if I want to have all of my huge list of dependencies in their secure environment and somebody has to put the sign of approval upon that. Since I usually, if it's only at generation time, I can do this on my home machine and then copy over the generated module code into the secure environment, this is usually not a deal breaker. It could be a convenience problem and a usability problem, but it's usually not a deal breaker. The next one, this is where I have the greatest philosophical conflict with uh, most notably Sampler and Stucco, whether we need anything at build time. Do I, can I just do a self-contained build script and I'm done, or do I first need to set up five separate modules like PSD Band, Saki, Invoke Build, or whatever else it's going to be, to execute a build process? Having those as a standard makes it easy from an open source community perspective, but from a secure code management perspective, if I want to bring a module into a secure environment, I generally want to take the code from Git, GitHub, copy that over into my internal source control, do a code review, and after I am confident with that, I do the build process internally to an internal repository. And at that point, I need to execute the build logic in a secure environment and every dependency needs to be properly reviewed. So that's my decision why I personally go for zero dependency at build time. On the other hand, that of course means my build logic is probably a bit more complicated. Finally, will the finished result have dependencies? That's arguably a good thing or a bad thing. For example, I believe that uh, everything in my framework stack is a perfectly legal dependency here. Your mileage might vary, but it's definitely something we want to consider. The next part, and we have a dedicated session on CI CD, a module project, if you're going to do this in bulk, we want automation here. Our modules are not pets, they're cattle. They're going to be mass producing them. We don't have, I don't have time to manually, you know, good module, here's your finished thing module. No, this needs to be so boringly automated that we don't have to do anything about that. For example, it takes me about 10 minutes to get a module ready from I've got nothing to a repository with pull request validation and pipeline run through until GitHub and the PowerShell gallery. So we want to look into that. And the key questions here are really how are we going to automate and what? Do we go specific to a particular platform? Is my automation tied to AppVayor? Do I go for all in and GitHub Actions and it will only work in GitHub Actions? Or am I agnostic to the platform and everybody can run it anywhere? The trade-off here is usually the more specific I am, the well, less effort I have to do make it work in any given environment. The more agnostic I am, the well, more flexible and easier it is, it is to reshare in another environment. So what am I going to automate? Dependencies installation. Specifically and in, uh, absolutely including bootstrap my def, bootstrapping a dev environment so that a coworker can easily get started on the dev part without having to first uh, try to do a like 10 step guide and how to get started developing on this. I'm a lazy person. So there's this one thing I'm never ever going to voluntarily do. It's called writing the docs on my bloody commands. So I have some automation here that forces me. Trust me, my project would not be half as well documented if I didn't have, didn't have that in my template. Um, build automation. I want to be able to optimize it. We'll be looking into the spe more specific requirements in testing and build afterwards. And finally, I also want to release automation done so that when there's some bug fix, from a person that didn't actually do full-time work on this module, but half a year later, one particular nasty thing, they don't actually have to do some manual figuring out how the hell do I ship this new version. They just click the button and they're done. And no matter which of our organization's 600, 625 modules that are, they click the same button and it gets done the same way. So that's, yeah, kind of important for me. So testing, what do we actually want to test? 
there is this general code testing, something I can test without knowing any particular piece of the code that I'm trying to well test. For example, did we comply to PowerShell best practices? There's this peer script analyzer. You might know that from VS Code with these yellow underlines curly when we are trying to use a parameter that uh, actually has a different name and there's some typo in there. So that's definitely something to test and catch us of Earth problems. We do have at least some recording, but I do believe we have also a session on that one. Help, was help properly written? Forces me to do that right. Personal opinion on my end, also internal functions. And not just the user facing, but every single command should have a fully written help with at least one example. It's the explanation for ourselves half a year later, two years later. I mean, don't hate your future self. Write the bloody docs. It doesn't have to be a huge essay, but at least like what was the thought, what's the purpose of this thing? And a quick example on how we're doing that. Syntax checking. We have the PowerShell parser built into PowerShell because PowerShell needs to parse the script code that I, well, give it, force upon it. And we can use that same tools to verify that what we're writing is actually syntactically correct. A lot easier on us to do it before we ship. And there are a lot of other things and requirements we could place upon the test. For example, test whether all the functions I wanted to export are actually being exported by the module. Or I could have requirements for specific encoding in the files. I'm a huge believer in UTF-8 with byte order mark. I could have a blacklist of commands I don't want to see in my code. For example, write host, or write verbose, or write anything that's not write piece of message. Again, opinionated here. So think like, what do you want to test? It doesn't have to be specific to the code. Because one of the problems with unit tests is somebody has to write them. The general tests we can do once and then be done with it, at least it's only a one-time effort. If we want full unit tests for everything, we could enforce that being provided, but then somebody has to go to and do it. Again, that's a team question mostly. How accepted is, how much time can a regular team member spend on writing the tests? How accepted will that be? Most admins I know um, are kind of going to let me choose which middle thing I want. So yeah, same for code coverage. How much code did we actually manage to cover? It's a difficult question, PowerShell already as it is. And there's this one more test. If I catch anybody of you after this talk doing this, we will have words. Tests about enforcing specific code styles. That is something you should not be doing. Why? I as a contributor, write the code, hey, here's this new feature, here's the bug fix I'm doing for you, and you tell me, okay, and now fix all the indentations and all the braces and everything. Assuming we're using VS Code, just put VS Code config on how your code is supposed to look in the project settings as part of the template. And then there's this nice config setting format on save. Put it also in there, and any contributor is automatically going to provide correctly formatted code. Don't do it in the tests. What do we do with building? There is a common practice that is strongly recommended, and that is compile to single file. We did that in DBA tools after uh, module import took 30 seconds. After we compiled everything in a single file, we had about slightly less than 1,000 files at that point. It dropped to three seconds. Every time we load a file, we do a lot of context checking. Should this be running in constraint language mode? Has it been properly signed? If it is signed, do we have a certificate revocation list that is complaining about that? There's a lot of effort happening in the background that is more likely to trip us than not, or at least cost unnecessary time. Security policies also get kind of more nitpicky if you have more than one file. This, of course, leads to us to one problem. If we need to debug a module in the field, because you know it works on my machine, so give it to a friend, it doesn't work on his, debugging can become a bit more annoying because suddenly the error happened in line uh, 10,123 and along in line 33 of script file XYZ. There are options about that. We will be seeing, at that, seeing that in a moment once we go into the demo part. Manifest, do we want to automate 
the manifest. We want to automatically set things like versions or what commands do we want to export. Automating that has the advantage it's more convenient. On the other hand, uh, automating version means we kind of give control over how do we determine the new version to our build automation, which might restrict our options. Or the commands to export, I kind of like to be caught when if I accidentally forgot something. If I automate that and I accidentally place an internal functions into the public functions folder, well, suddenly that function is going to be exported even though I didn't want to do that. And since it's an extra command, nobody is going to complain about missing functionality. It's just going to be well exposed, which might be wanted or might not be so quite desirable. So I like to do the two manually. Your mileage might vary. And the next part that I'm very concerned with, can I import it without building it first? This makes it a lot easier if we can do so for unexperienced developers just trying to make things work if we don't need to first go to a ladder and set up an entire test environment. On the other hand, if we are mostly building hybrid modules or C-sharp based modules, there's kind of no point to doing it without building first. So again, depending on what you want, this might be an option to make optional, to configurable, however that works for you. So that's basically my decision tree. When I work for something, I have some customers where I can't just use my tools. I've got some German pub, public uh, sector customers who want everything to be done in-house, so I might have reinvented that particular wheel more than once. But my wheels are shiny. So we should be seeing something. Good. You can go away and something to drink would not be amiss. So, Mars, where are you? Screen, let there be light. So, I've prepared a few examples on different projects, not just mine, even if I'm kind of opinionated in that direction. The PS module option has mostly two kind of pre-built module projects we could be looking at. We have the mini module and the PSF project. The mini module is kind of designed to be um, as little complex as Fred is willing to stomach kind of module, which has the key benefit that the finished artifact doesn't have any dependencies. While the PSF project is like my full PowerShell project built depending on PS framework, and removing the PS framework dependency can be a bit of a chore on that one. I mean, but why would you want to remove that? So let's dump that and lump that. Oh, first, yes. Need to insert some values here, whatever, and whatever else. And I have here two new full module projects. We'll be looking into the particular content there in a moment. The next one I like to uh, show a quick intro on the, what we get from that sampler, which, well, is I think uh, Raymond Andre was somewhat involved with there and Yap. I might be wrong about that one. I'm bad with, na with particular name memory. Mm -hmm. It again asks us for a few things. Oh. Yeah, that's okay. You get a bit more verbose output on what's happening. But at the end of the day, the same thing. We get a module project with different kinds of logic there. Looking into the mini module for a moment, we have at the root level a readme file we want to mod modify. This is what users are going to see when they open the GitHub project. The license file, I am strictly focused on MIT license because my, working as Microsoft, that's part of our open source policy that anything I share must be MIT license. A simple git ignore. GitHub actions integration, so we get automatic pull request validation and release to the gallery. And finally, the actual mod is build automation logic here. Pre Install prerequisites, run the tests, 
and then build it and release it in one step. Internally, simple structure, we've got a public functions folder and internal functions and scripts. I know that most of the communities are like public and private. It's, uh, I've always res uh, resisted it for a fairly, uh, fairly silly reason, actually. I believe that uh, separating a module into public and private kind of narrows the focus down that a module is only providing functions. That's kind of a limitation on uh, my way of thinking about modules that are rejected because modules could have key bindings, modules could have, well, scripts that run on import, modules could have config files, modules could have whatever else. There's a wide range of PowerShell resources we could be providing and limiting myself to functions felt limiting. But not much more else there. We have the startup thing in PSM1 and the build file will replace this with all of the contents here and ship it. Well, that's the simple one. Not quite as simple is the PSF project thing. We have a pre-configured C Sharp solution that is going to build into the bin folder inside of the module. We have a folder called AZ Function Resources, which includes uh, the necessary tools to use this uh, module actually as a function app. It's going to use every public function, provide every public function as an HTTP endpoint. But other than that, we have internally mostly the same structure, only that in the internal there's a few more options for piece framework features. Not much else to see there. Localization files, because piece framework has localization integrated, bin folder for binary files, and some XML for formatting and types. And, and this is the one part where, I'm really care, where I really do show both of them. There is in the PSM1 one critical important difference, and that is all the compiled code, when we push everything in a single file, is going to be placed in the string. But there is also an option to instead load the individual files. So with a full PSF project, I can, on the target server, switch into two individual files and debug uh, with stack traces that actually contain the individual function files and not like this one huge PSM1. So that helps me with the debugging part. In the sampler part, many similar uh, uh, decisions were taken what we have mostly here. As a difference, we have here pre-configuration for Visual Studio Code. Including style settings, we can look as a reference and decide how the hell do we want to configure our projects from a VS Code perspective, which I'm probably going to steal from my next ver uh, borrow for my next version. Useful things. Other than that, we have similar items, a few more options pre-configured for PowerShell resources, again private and public. And the one thing I don't care much about here is we have a lot of files at the root folder that is probably going to that are probably going to confuse a newcomer because when you now open this for the first time there's like 10 12 15 files there and I now need to figure out which of them is I have to care about or not and where the hell do I find even find the module yeah a few examples here for the different project considerations. Any questions? Doesn't sound like it. Okay, in that case, case I'm going to just move ahead with the last demo that I've prepared. And that is um, creating my own template. This is a, now going to be one of 100% advertisement pitch for piece module development. I mean, you have been warned that, that I kind of brag about my toys occasionally. So um, piece module development comes with a few templates out of the box. Now there is one column here, store, which is how piece module development knows where to look for templates. Additional stores can be provided by group policy. 
Additional stores can be declared by a module upon import. So there's different ways to ship additional templates. But at this most simple part, we now want to record a new template because in the opposite to plaster, we don't like the live reference to this template folder with everything in there. We do a, have a recording step where we record a new template and then we can call it as many times as we want without having to care where the template is actually being stored. So let's take a look at a template file, which is the thorn name thorn.ps1. I want a simple function template. Now you might be wondering what the hell is this character? Thorn, a character unique to the Icelandic language, which obviously means that the last PSConf we used some harsh words were exchanged with an Icelandic attendee. Okay, not quite as harsh, but yes, there was some irony at least involved. Um, this turned out to be a bit harder to type than I originally intended because on a German keyboard that's Alt, press down 999 and you're done. The problem is that only works on a German keyboard and you're stuck with uh, depressed down, uh, Alt and numpad 0254, which uh, will create lead to interesting reactions inside VS Code because it's going to tap, uh, change tabs and everything. So there is a configuration setting to change that to whatever you care, <laughs> including multiple characters. If you want to placeholder underscore underscore underscore, that's up to you. We can select the file name or the, any string, provide some name inside, label inside like name, and it is then going to prompt me for the parameter name when I'm invoking the template. I can also put something curly braces inside and it's going to dynamically execute it. And this is all we need to provide a template, a file as a template. And I can now record it. It's there under my function, stored in the default folder and my app data, since I didn't provide a different template store. And I can then use invoke PSMD template to create a new file from that. And there we are. Name inserted. Example, as far as it goes. Date provided. But now here's one thing. Company and offer were also provided. They were here as a placeholder, but we were never asked for them. This is part of this whole, um, there's no kill like overkill with features stick that I've got going. PS Framework has amongst other things a configuration system, think of it like an options menu for your modules. And PS module development uses that and has the ability to provide default values for parameters. We can still provide them anyway, but we are not going to be prompted for that. You can add as many additional config settings as you want if you put additional parameters you want to deploy by default. So, another somewhat more complex project that we're going to do uh, to record is a simple module project where we have multiple files with multiple placeholders and dynamical insert to generate that for us. So let's record that. It's now listed under my module. And I can now invoke this. Let's pre-provide, override the company parameter here. Parameters company equals contoso LTD. Still going to ask for the name. And there we are with our latest project. All right, that's all I have for today. Any questions? We're kind of running out of time now, hitting the deadline, but you know where to find me. As warned, it's never a problem to get me to start it about any of my toys. Very happy to do so. Just know when to uh, start the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you for joining.